Good afternoon and welcome to Real Chicks Represents Real Discussions. I am your host, Michelle Dosbert, and as always, I am super excited to be here with you on a Sunday. We are here every first and third Sunday at 2 p.m., and we did not let the snow in Atlanta stop us from giving us a live show today. Yes! We thank God. We're thankful for technology. We have power. Everyone is safe where they're supposed to be. So this is an awesome opportunity to just spread some good information today because, boy, we're going to need it. So as, as I mentioned, we're getting some snow here in the Atlanta area. It started about 9.30 this morning um, with, the, with the sleet and the rain, and now it's starting to stick. The northern part of Atlanta is getting hit harder than us. Here in the city, like I'm close to the airport, but my guests today are north of Marietta and they're like, no, it is really starting to come down. We're just praying that we still have power and we do. So we, That's are, right. <laughs> we are so <laughs> excited today. Let me just give a little background for my new listeners about what Real Chicks Rock is all about. Real Chicks Rock is all about creatively uh, collaborating and connecting to raise awareness regarding is issues that impact women. And we do it by way of community service, public speaking, mentoring, workshops, and the arts. And as I was sharing with my guests here today in the green room, we have been blessed to be doing this particular platform through this uh, podcast and talk show for uh, over six years. And so we're super excited because we continue to bring good, informative information and topics for our listeners. And today is no different. Today, my topic is farming, how we grow and glow. And I have the beautiful couple of Key and Kenyatta Mandela. Hi, guys. How are you today? We are wonderful. Good, it's us. Good. We are the Muendas. Muenda. Muendas, yes. Good, good afternoon. Thank you guys for joining us. I'm so glad that you guys were able to join. Um, and like I said in the beginning, that the, the environment, the weather conditions are not as favorable, but we're bringing the sunshine in today with this conversation. So let's just get right into it. Where are you guys from? I mentioned that you guys are located north of uh, Marietta. And, uh, so that's like 30 minutes of Marietta. So you guys are like way up north, correct? Yes. yes, yes, but where we're from is, is a little bit different from that, um, and I'll start, because I'm a native Georgian, I'm a native Georgia peach, uh, of course, okay. <laughs> there's not a lot of us around anymore, but I was born and raised in Polk County, which is on the Alabama-Georgia border, uh, here mm -hmm. in Northwest Georgia, a little town called Rock Mart that is primarily known for having been a rock quarry um, center in like the early 1700s and 1800s around that time and um that's where i was born and bred and raised i'm a good old country no red lights now many many red lights of course um you know dozens and dozens of years later uh, but that's me i'm, I'm a red dirt country girl <laughs> and king out where are you from and I, i'm from a much different background i'm originally from cali california <laughs> The Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, the big city, urban. So um, from being from the big city, I always appreciated the country. Um, I didn't come down south, but we used to go camping and do things outdoors. So I appreciate the country. I appreciate nature um, and just being able to be in tune with the earth. But it's it's a lot louder in the city, a lot more noise, a lot of sirens and yeah. all kind of things going on. Yeah, yeah. So how did you guys, what kind of foods did you eat as kids? Kenyatta, for you, coming from the Bay Area, what were, what were some of the foods that you ate as a kid? <laughs> well, my, um, my parents uh, raised me on like a lot of organic foods. Um, we did eat pork growing up, but it was like far and few between. But a lot of whole grain stuff, a lot of um, just natural foods. Mm -hmm. And so like 100% juice, you know, fish. Uh, my family is originally from Louisiana, Baton Rouge. So we had Creole, we had gumbo. Um, and then my mom is Filipino. Chamoran from Guam, so we have Pacific Island food. That's how I grew up. Good food, 
Uh, there's not a lot of not a lot of fast food, not a lot of processed food at all. It's just good home cooking, just a di- in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Key, how about for you? What were you eating? I, ha- I have to, I have to just you know just come right behind that. And I know that for us growing up, it was the same thing. We were farm to table before farm to table was a thing, and before it was you know marketable. Um, coming from a country area in the way that I did. My great aunt had a large farm. Um, My grandmother and all of her sisters, they grew up gardening. They grew up farming themselves, coming from a sharecropper background. Growing your own food was something that was very, that was just common. You know, that's that's what you did, especially to kind of supplement, you know, what you would have to pick up from the store. So I grew up beans, greens, tomatoes. We, we also ate pork originally growing up. Uh, my great aunt, she, they farmed hogs. So, you know, we had that experience of being little kids and seeing them, you know, take care of the animals. Um, and then all of us little kids would kind of stand around. And, you know, my, my grandmother and her sisters would be making sausage literally like right on the spot, you know, doing all of these things in order to and putting up food in, in the smokehouse, just wanting to make sure that all of the families, you know, would, would get a portion of, you know, the hog that they killed and some aspects of it. Uh, we also, of course, were fishing all of the time. There are a number of creeks that are in the Rock Martin and Polk County area. So if someone went fishing and they, they came back, then, you know, you ate whatever the catch was. Most of the time that was brim. Occasionally it would be trout or bass if someone went to a lake. Uh, a lot of times it would be crappy. So that's, that's what we grew up eating. Mm. So you, so farming was always in your family. It was, was Absolutely. it like, it was their primary source of income. It wasn't a side, just a side thing. This is what they did, your family, to bring, you know, revenue into the house. Some of them, yes. Some of them, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Man, so this is awesome. So you already, you've been doing this. You knew what it was since you were a little kid. So you've been bringing eating properly when did you decide to stop eating pork and why because that's i think for some people that's it that's the thing like you know they just say i'm gonna stop eating it and for some it's religious reasons personal beliefs sometimes it's health but for you key what was it for you that made you say i'm you know i'm not going for me it was it was primarily a a health thing and i i you know did the journey like in high school you know and doing some education and being um, you know, reading a lot before I, I went off to college, then I made the choice. And so I, I didn't eat pork for about a decade, about nine years. And then, I mean, for lack of a better word, I kind of got bored. And I said, oh, okay, you know, well, I'll incorporate it. I liked bacon more than anything. So I was like, well, I'll eat bacon every now and again. And then I, I you know, it, and after a couple of years passed, I was like, ah, you know what, now there's better turkey, turkey bacon options, beef bacon options, you know, so I moved away from it again and haven't returned. It was primarily spurred by uh, a health, you know, component, just because it was so integral to our childhood and to, um, you know, to the Black experience overall, especially in the South, you know, it's like, hey, you use that thing from the rooter to the tutor is the way that my big mama would say, and there was no waste, and it was just a part of, you know, the life with regards to seasonings and um, to a lot of those traditional food ways. And in moving away from that and, you know, starting to incorporate healthier ways of living, healthier modes of cooking, then we've just been able to not, not look back. Mm, awesome. For you, Kenyatta, when, for you, you came from a very um, organic type of food with your family. Did you have any challenges when you moved to Atlanta? Because, again, we're in the South and people like certain foods. Did you find it difficult to find like-minded people like yourself eating and moving the same way with foods? Um, not, not too much. Uh, when I first came to Atlanta, I was in, I was in the West end. Uh, okay. Yeah. So there was some people that are more conscious that, that eat good, um, mm-hmm. organic foods, uh, just, um, they more, more mindful of their body and their spirit and their mind. Uh, so, it's, it, it wasn't hard to meet people like that. Um, and I stopped eating pork in 94. So I it's, I find the places that are good and the people are there. So you see, you meet people that eat good when you go to places that are organic or that are healthy for you. 
and the West End still is that community where that's where people go to to tap into organic living or eating the lifestyles, different quality of food, people that are growing uh, their products, selling it, you know, on the side or just that's where you want to go. Right. The information where you want to change your lifestyle. And, it, and it, to me, it's still flourishing. It's more and more people walking in that type of awareness and knowledge, as you um, discovered while we were talking in the green room, that there's more and more of us that are really starting to embody just eating better and, and cleaner. So I want to ask you guys, how did you guys collectively get into farming? How did it happen for you? Well, once we started dating and then eventually starting to to live together, then he's like, okay, you've got an entire acre. And at the time I was growing in containers and I wasn't, you know, utilizing the land in that way. You know, like most homes have a lawn. And so it was just, oh, you know, we'll keep the grass nice, have your nice decorative trees. Uh, and I, again, I was growing tomatoes and peppers and herbs in baskets and in containers and not even thinking okay, you've got literally an acre, an entire acre of land that has hardwoods and there's, you know, a lot of natural herbs and uh, wildcrafted, you know, type herbs and traditional medicines that grow here, as we we discovered, you know, in time. And he said, we, we should be, we should be working the land, like, let's move away from the containers and get into the ground. So Kenyatta mm -hmm. was really the impetus for that. Yeah, wow. Way to go. Yeah. Way to go. Yeah, so we, um, <laughs> we decided one time to to try it out, you know, and so um, I built some beds and we got the soil, we put in soil, we we put in um, different like compost and everything we did was always natural. It's just we really had to work the, the ground mm -hmm. because it is a uh, rocky soil mm -hmm. and we started planting and we did, we planted seeds by hand. What was the first thing we planted? Uh, we, and we planted some okra. Okra, tomatoes, tomatoes. corn, radishes. Mm -hmm. Just in doing studying and really relying on, for me, a lot of the things that my, my big mama and that I, I, I gleaned from her and from her sisters, because I can literally remember having a hoe in my hand around the age of five. Six, six at oldest. I mean, I can, I can, I can visually remember looking over my shoulder and watching the hole to kind of make sure that I didn't bump myself in the head with it because it was so much taller than I was. In um, and taking the opportunity to work the land and you know dig out rocks and things like that. So once we made the decision to be organic and to really just work on building the quality of the soil. I mean, it was a lot of work and a lot of, you know, physical backbreaking work because this area of Georgia is known for its limestone, is known for quartz, it's known, you know, for for slate and for a lot of those other hard rocks. And it's, trust me, it's here. That's exactly what our ground is. You know, once you get past the first couple of levels of, of topsoil, which was probably brought in by the developer, then it's just rock and it's stone. So we've had to collectively build the soil. You know, we, we use mushroom compost. We now compost our own. So we have our own compost where we're taking and recycling the um, our fruit and vegetable scraps, a lot of our, our yard waste, and even, you know, things, plants that we decide not to, not to utilize, you know, in some capacity around the farm, putting that stuff in. We've got a, a great um, mycelium layer, you know, like the, the mushrooms are doing their job. It's just, it's beautiful to see it and to see the land really develop and to, to really see the, the nutrients in the soil, to be able to pick it up and see earthworms for it to be mm -hmm. now loose versus being this hard rock clay and rocks that we originally started with. It's been a really beautiful process and, and, and it's, 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 it's been fruitful, you know, yeah. for lack of a better word. Has it been a long process to get the ground to be fertile and, fr and fruitful to your point? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, and it's, a, it's a constant work in progress because, of course, as you grow things and as you, um, you know, we cycle things around so that we're never growing the same commodity or the same product within the same area of the land mm -hmm. so that, you know, you, you're able to put nutrients back in organically. We do things like planting legumes um, and beans, peas, things that are nitrogen fixers for the soil. We plant them. And then the following year, we may plant brassicas or greens um, or lettuces or something that are heavy nitrogen feeders in that same area because we've, we, we built the soil, you know, for the previous year. And just, 
you know, paying attention to what the soil tells us and to what the land tells us. If you pick it up or you turn it over and you, we, again, if we don't see earthworms, then we know, okay, there's something that's lacking here because when you see like the, the, the small animals, if you will, and your small insect activity, that's definitely a sign as to whether or not your soil is healthy because they're going to be there because there are things there that nourish them the same way as it would nourish your plants and nourish your root system so that you have quality produce in the end. And I, I, would, say, Thank you, I, would, yeah. I, I would just say that even from the beginning, we were blessed because we both have a green thumb. So we were, we were blessed with some vegetables and some um, herbs. Just over time, we were able to have more, to multiply that and to learn more about this specific land and the, um, the pests that come and natural ways to get rid of them. And then, like Keisha said, we rotate. And then we also put in um, foods like the peanuts that add uh, nitrogen to the, the earth and break up the soil. So then you have a much more fruitful soil, healthy soil that you can put anything in there and it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. Mm. I know that's very, that is very fulfilling to be able to take something that wasn't there, right, and learn about it, the research. Because sometimes for us, we don't research. We may go on YouTube. We may do it word of mouth um, because we don't really understand. We think it's, we can grow it. So we grow, we just go ahead and start building and do it. And I'm not knocking anybody that's doing that. But I do want to commend you both for taking the time to really investigate and do the research to understand even everything that you grow, even if as if it may be considered a waste, you're repurposing that, right? Like nothing is a waste in, in your That's life. Right. Everything that is, is one of our goals, yes, to be zero waste as much as possible. We also, you know, implement recycling here within the home. We recycle metal, we recycle glass, we recycle plastic. So having that earth conservation and earth um, you know, restorative mindset is is key to our farming process and to our living process. Do you think you think we as Black people are starting to gravitate more to this type of lifestyle? Oh, definitely. It's a lot more people that are wanting to and grow because even people come up to us and when we talk to them about what we have, our you know, our products, our farm, it's like, how can we do that? I've mm -hmm. always wanted to do that. You know, and so there's a lot more of us wanting to do that, which is is natural because that's where we started from. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We we weren't going to McDonald's and Burger King and and doing that. Like Keisha, her family, she's blessed to know her grandmother, great grandmother that were actually growing right in the backyard. You could pick it up. Uh, you know, that's amazing to me. I, I didn't have that. You know, um, my dad. <laughs> My dad was a um, a cannabis grower, so that's the aspect I got, and, and like roses and plants and flowers. But the food, the food aspect, that's amazing, and a lot more people are wanting to do that because either they have the space. Sometimes they don't have the space, but even if you have a little space, you you have enough space. You can make the space, even if it's concrete, because you can build a bed, and you can you can grow anywhere. That's, and that's our, our 2022 motto is absolutely that you can grow anywhere and essentially you can grow anything. And to your point, Michelle, regarding doing the investigation and, and doing the research, a portion of that is always going to be trial and error just because, you know, your soil makeup may be different. Uh, your household makeup may be different. I always encourage people, if you're going to grow it, make sure that it's something that your family eats. Make sure it's something that you can use. Make sure it's something that you can utilize in some way. Or even if you don't, then give it away. You know, the 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 beauty of growing, and for me, it goes just beyond, you know, the way that we do for food consumption. But also there's the economic impact. Over the last few years, you know, our the dollars that we spend within the store environment on produce are extremely low extremely low. I mean, we're primarily buying fruit, but we, we have fruit trees. And so we know, you know, within a few years, as they start to mature more, you're in their third year now, this year, we got our first lemons, we got our first, yeah. um, our first mandarins. And that was just, it was beautiful. You know, it's like, wow, we've had these trees for three that years. Was a long process. <laughs> and they finally produced. Um, and we also, we have figs, we have uh, cherries, pears, apples, 
we have berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. So as those plants mature, as they grow, and of course, as we grow, you know, along with them, then we'll be able to reap more and more. It's about taking care of them, being good stewards of those plants, being good stewards of the ground and with what we've been entrusted with and then being able to reap that return, share it with others. We have a a small food manufacturing company that's Big Mama's Best. That's an extension of our farm. So much of what we grow, the organic produce actually goes into our products and into our product line. So to be sustaining in that way is, is, you know, even more purposeful. And obviously there's a significant uh, economic impact there as well. How do, can we get Big Mama's Best here in Atlanta? You like, absolutely oh, can. Of course. You absolutely can. Our website is is our primary method of distribution. We also sell at local <laughs> farmers markets, wherever wherever we can. And and it, for us, it's a lot of uh, education from that aspect as well. A lot of people are not familiar with the products. My grandmother's recipes are what I'm reproducing. They're uh, roughly 80 years old, and it's a lot of southern relishes and southern pickle recipes. We produce a watermelon rind recipe. Because again, being zero waste, you know, we eat the watermelon flesh, we use the watermelon flesh or for juice or for fruit, and then repurpose the rind into a pickle that, you know, is what was one of her recipes. Her cha-cha, which is, you know, like a southern pickle relish that has a lot of heat in it. A lot of people like it hot. So we, we produce that as well. And then we have uh, spicy garlic dill pickles, as well as a mild version of that. And then our okra pickles, which... Listen, when I first started producing the okra pickles, I had no idea that this was considered like a, a Southern delicacy, if you will. I knew that there were some people within my family that enjoy them. A few people, you know, we, we grow okra and we eat okra. We like okra. Uh, we appreciate, you know, like the health benefits that the plant affords us. But then to take it and put them into pickle form, mm. it's our best seller. People wow. absolutely go bananas over the okra pickles. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. I want to ask you both. For the beginner, what would be some of the things we should start growing? I mean, somebody that does not have a green thumb, but really wants to try to do something different. And what, so what would be some of the vegetables we should try to start growing in our in our backyard? Yeah, I would say for I would say first, like um, peppers. OK, um, peppers are easy to grow and you put the seed in there and it starts growing and then it it just takes off. And as you see the little peppers grow, that's, that's fulfilling, you know, something you can see that starts small and then gets produces a pepper, the okra, the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, okra, I'm trying to think the first time we grew the okra, as a matter of fact, the first time, the first year we grew okra, it was like, what, five, six feet tall. It was what? tall. And then the okra started coming out and what? forming and they form, and then you pick it, and then it seems like the next day there's another one. Wow! And it's like it's so it's so amazing. That was like one of my most amazing uh, experiences watching something grow, and it grows fast. Like when it grows in the summertime, because it loves the heat, it grows. And then there's the okra. You pick that off, and it's like the next day is another okra. <laughs> so I would definitely say like the um, the peppers, the okra. Um, I will say strawberries okay. and I tend okay. to think on things that yeah. you know from the perspective of what Kenyatta is sharing that are, are not going to be difficult to take care of don't have like high water needs especially with yeah. where we are here in the south and for us we, we also practice water conservation and rain recycling we have a rain catchment system mm. that provides probably a good 80% of our water needs we have three large um 275 to 300 gallon totes that we collect water in and then utilize that to water our crops. A lot of people don't have that benefit. Of course, we, we recommend and, and tell people like, look, again, with that grow anywhere mindset, you could catch water in a little bucket and use that depending on, you know, how large of a, of a crop you're growing or, you know, small plants, small containers. Strawberries are something that are container friendly. Cucumbers are container friendly and very oh, yeah. easy to grow as well. Yeah. I would also suggest tomatoes. And again, they kind of grow, uh, you know, in that same the same way as, as peppers and and okra. And another thing that's uh, not necessarily indigenous to the South, but that grows really well here in the South is is going to be sweet potatoes. And they also don't require tons and tons and tons of water. We've been able to do really well with those and herbs. 
I was just about to say. They're herbs. herbs. Yes, they're very forgiving. And then, of course, they're complementary and, and growing them with your plants when you're looking to do things like absolutely use no insecticides whatsoever, no pesticides as, as far as your, your insect management for your plants, wherever they are. And basil, sage, uh, marigolds. Peppermint. Um, Yes, mm. mint plants, all of these things are very beneficial in growing them in conjunction with your fruits or vegetables because they help to keep the bugs away using, you know, their different properties and the, the constituents that are within those plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, to piggyback on what Keisha said earlier, the basil is the, the plant that we used to give away to our customers when they would buy different products, the pickles or whatever. We had a whole bunch of basil just growing, and it, it smells so good. It's so fresh, and we just will cut it off and give it to people when they buy something because it was that we had that much. And little did we know we were we were <laughs> we think we're giving it to people to utilize and to cook with, and then we had people come back and say, "Oh, I took the basil that you gave us and we rooted it. Now we have this giant basil yeah. plant." So we were literally spurring little you know people to grow <laughs> and to utilize it. Absolutely, yeah. awesome. some of the private chefs that take our that take our produce, they they actually did that, and it was really that was really inspirational to hear. I need some basil today for what I'm cooking for dinner. What have any in the house? I you should send me some. Send me some this way. We got you send some seeds. We can absolutely send you seeds. And that's another thing that we do as well, especially since we are all organic and non-GMO, is that we do. We open pollinate. We're we're really blessed to be in an area where there are about three beekeepers around us within a two two to five mile radius. Mm -hmm. And so we get a good amount of pollinators, uh, different, you know, bees and butterflies, other insects that come in and that help to, you know, open pollinate our plants. And then when we don't have them, because there have been some seasons where <laughs> the pollinators are low, then we are the pollinators. That's right. We're out there hand pollinating and, you know, making sure that especially for, for things like squash, where we don't necessarily want uh, cross contamination and cross pollination within the plants, then, you know, in order to make sure that your cucumber doesn't turn into a pumpkin or that right. your acorn squash doesn't become, <laughs> doesn't become a scallop squash, then you want to make sure that you're doing the pollination yourself from plant to plant to control that. How do you do it? What do you do? Uh, we use we use sometimes the plant itself, the male, you know, the male of a plant, like a squash plant. The male, oh. so the male will have the the the, uh, the pollen, yeah, the the stamen, and and then you cut that, and then you stick it into Is the lady that... plant. <laughs> 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 I call it diddling the squash. Diddling, you go out there in the morning while the flowers are open, and you take the male flower, you cut him off, pull the leaves back, and then just put him in there, yeah, give him a little twirl. Sometimes, yeah, you got to pull the leaves back some and get in there. Yeah, it's... it's and I'm, we use paintbrushes and Q-tips as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning. I'm learning today. Now that we are in the middle of a pandemic, right, and not only the snow, but we were also trying to be safe, too, are you growing some things more than you were before to keep immune systems up or build up immune? You want to talk a little bit about that? Keisha, how about Absolutely. you? Absolutely. One was, of the things that's inherent to, to, to my bloodline is being an herbalist. I have okay. great aunts and my grandmother, okay. all of her sisters, they, within their food gardens, also grew herbs, you know, that were considered medicinal so we, in turn, um, and, and as I've leaned really more into, you know, who I am from just that internal perspective and, you know, really focused on, okay, Keisha, this is who you are at your core. You can't escape it. You can't move away from it. So uh, we have elderberries that are wild here. We actually also transplanted some wild elderberry plants from our area and moved them here to our farm. So we have elderberries that grow here. Obviously, we have uh, all of the herbs. So we have your mint. We're growing uh, chocolate mint, peppermint, spearmint. We have lemon balm, which is a calming herb, and, and we grow that, and it's, it's, it runs away. It's absolutely prolific, and it, it goes and goes and goes. Uh, we're growing sage, which, of course, has some respiratory components. We, we have the raspberries, so we've got the red raspberry leaf that's good for a lot of female, you know, our, our, uh, our reproductive system. We have that going, and obviously the peppermint being good for digestion. We also have mullein, which is another respiratory herb. And we produce teas and, and, and herbal tinctures and things like that from all of these products and from other things that we go out and wildcraft. We've been blessed to have lion's mane mushrooms that are close to our property. And now we've got a little yes. small culture here, turkey tail mushrooms. And so we tincture those as well and utilize them within um, medicinal um, 
medicinal methods, you know, primarily within tinctures for people to be able to utilize. Mm, awesome. That's excellent. There's, there's a, unfortunately, the, even though we are blessed in curating the land, right? We've always been, as African Americans, Black people, we've always been able to become one with the land. We can build. We thrive. We, we're just talented in that space. But unfortunately, it's not a lot of us as Black farmers. True statement? I would absolutely say that. And I know I read a statistic recently, and this is also one of the statistics that, um, you know, I, I went out and did some research because there is some funding, you know, now that's starting to, to, to come forward with regards to, you know, the different um, presidential administrations and government administrations to where they are making some attempts to, uh, you know, compensate black farmers and to encourage there to be more black farmers because we used to make up such a large portion of the farming network, particularly mm -hmm. in the South, but also, you know, in the United States, in the Midwest, in those areas, we were, we, we made up about 15, 14 to 15% of all farmers were black. Now that number is less than 2%. It's around that 1.5% number. So there are some, some things, you know, that are in the pipeline. Now there's some funding that's in the pipeline now in order to encourage black farmers and, and also, again, to compensate uh, families who previously owned farms and then maybe had that land taken from them, you know, in unscrupulous methods to be able to be, you know, get their, get their, at least what that, that, that land was worth or to have the land restored to them. And it's, it's encouraging, you know, to see that. And I, I feel like the more we have overall support, and again, even getting back to those, the economic, you know, impact where we're circulating the dollars and we're buying from one another within our own mm -hmm. communities, right. black people supporting black people, um, and, and then also encouraging, you know, white people to support black people. In the area that we're in, <clears throat> we're in, you know, the minority, you know, from, from, a, from a demographic perspective. So a great deal of our customers are white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, people that don't necessarily look like us. Of course, we get the support from those who do, but a, a large portion of our customer base and of our, um, you know, potential client base is people that are not people of color. So encouraging them and having them understand that they also play a part in being a part of that, you know, restorative process and in making sure that we get back what's, what's due to us. And like in, in, in our area, it's like we're we're the black farmers, but as you get closer to Atlanta, and we've gone and 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 uh, collaborated and worked with different farms in Atlanta, there's pockets of black farmers, which is nice. It's wonderful, you know. But a lot of people that were blessed to have land um, as a family, some of them didn't understand or understand the benefits of having land and then a lot of us black people don't have land so on a mass production level you have more people that don't look like us that have the land and farm the land as big business and then we have a little bit if some of us have some land then we do that um but it's it's a mind state and so as we educate people about being self-sustaining self-sufficient and self-reliant you have to have your own land. You have to have your own piece of earth, which this is all our earth because it's all God's earth. But we we have to get into the earth. We have to grow into the earth so we can make our own um, foods, our own products, and then collaborate with one another. That's that's the thing. So it's a mind it's a mind state that we have to get into to to be able to multiply. Um, and that, you know, like more, have more black farmers. It's, it's a mind, Kenyatta, as well as our lifestyle has changed, right? We are so busy um, just trying to find ways to earn an income, right? Take care of our families. And um, farming is beautiful, but it has risks, right? Right? Weather right. conditions can mm -hmm. can change the whole trajectory of what you've forecasted for your land you know some kind of you know mother nature happens and then you know you're in a situation so i commend you and other people that are farmers because it is a risk 
And we don't know where we would be as a consumers. It's so easy for us to either shop from you or just go to the store and pick up what we want. You know, so easy to do that. But you guys, night and day, are toiling in, in, in nurturing the ground and producing food that we eat, that we consume. So I thank you both for what you do. And as we become more conscious on our health, right, not only just the pandemic, but we're aging, you know, and we want to age gracefully. We want to be healthy. We want to be healthy. Um, black women, we are, we are combating fibroids and thyroids and, you know, cancer scares and all of these things. And we want to, like, black people are putting in the work. Thank God for the internet because it is something we can go to and at That's least right. begin the, the exchange of information and then find the pockets of people that are like-minded to kind of help us because the, me the messaging today is to be not to beat anyone up if you're not farming or if you're not in a healthy lifestyle, but take that first step to begin, right? Because yeah, that's it. Every, every fruit or vegetable that you eat is going to add, you know, to you in a very good way. Right. We want to, because there's so much different energies and agendas in the world, right? It's mm -hmm. people like you that are helping to empower us to take some of that power back in the food that we eat. So if we grow it ourselves, we know exactly what it is. We're putting yeah, it into it. the body, right? That's right. Of controlling the narrative for mm -hmm. our health, right? Right. That's right. So that's, that's what. It. So thank you so much for doing that. I want to ask you: Do you guys have classes? Even though you're far, half car will travel. Do you come down to Atlanta? Can we do some webinars? Like, how do how do we start? And I'm sure you're already doing it. So share with us. How do you share this information through classes, through webinars? Do you have like a book, like you have a YouTube? Tell us how you share. Well, people can find us from a social media perspective. We do have a small Facebook presence. We're much more active on Instagram. We're okay. K2K Farms everywhere. Um, and that's K, the number two K Farms. And our website is k2kfarms.com. So they can definitely catch up with us there. From an educational perspective, this spring we're moving into doing hosting an Airbnb experience where we'll bring people here and people will have the opportunity, again, to spend a couple of hours with us. And we will teach anybody who uh, comes for the class that they can literally grow anywhere. Once we've got that launched, we hope to expand and then to build even more on the, the preservation component of once you're growing your own food and once you start to, you know, maybe mass produce from a family perspective, how can I save some of this? You know, how do I go about drying? How do I go about freeze drying, dehydrating, canning? That's something that I do. Our, our pickle line is, uh, we can it, you know, we, we, we can that and we produce that. Um, so that's, that's another educational point that we want to encourage people to come back to. And again, as Kenyatta stated earlier, being growers, being farmers, uh, being stewards of the land, that's, it's our right as black people. That is something that is definitely inherent to us. You know, I mean, even from the very beginnings, you know, of time, this is what we did and, and being, mm -hmm. you know, excellent food cultivators all over the continent. And then of course, within the diaspora, every place that we went, that gift and that skill set is something that is uniquely ours. And I, and I think I love saying that because I think you can't you can't think about food and how it's produced in any place on the con on on the earth and not think about how a black hand helped to or a black mind or a black processes you know help to influence that help to influence your methodology or help to influence that what you grow and what's where you know even from seed distribution perspective and how we brought things you know from the continent to here and then utilize them repurpose them cross cross-pollination, the farming aspect of it, the science aspect of it, the medicinal aspect of it, all of that belongs to us. And it absolutely thrills me to be able to share that. Uh, within our website, people do already have the option to book individual classes. We also do individual consultations where if someone wants to grow within their home space, Kenyatta again is the carpenter, he's the builder, that's the, the materials guy. So yeah. he comes out, we do uh, site surveys. We also will test your soil and then that way we're able to help you understand how you need to amend your soil in order to uh, produce more, you know, with what you grow. Um, and, and 
So that's those are the two ways primarily that people have to be able to, to contact us. We don't have a YouTube space yet, but hopefully that's something that we'll move into in the future. Okay. Now, there's some people that um, have very small spaces, like apartment living, and I see it's this hydroponic, I think. Is that what that is, where it's like a... It, I don't know if it has, it has soil and it has water that goes to it. Do you guys that's know what it? you're... That's what your producer has, the, hydro, the hydroponic um, system. Mm -hmm. So when, when, before I moved here, I was in Alabama and I had an um, apartment, right? And so right outside the apartment, it was like a little piece of dirt, right? That maybe five by five. So I started putting, and this is just for outside, this is a little space. I start putting, um, I put soil there. I start putting my food scraps, which is vegetables and fruits only, eggshells. And I didn't even, I didn't even put any seeds per se in that, but I had a big tomato vine that came out and just started growing tomatoes. And then I did buy um, some herbs, some sage, rosemary, basil, um, and, and had the little pots out there. So people in the urban area, that may have a little bit of dirt outside their door or they're on their side, um, they can do that. Or, you know, somebody like myself, I can build a bed if you don't have any. If you just have a little two-by-two two space or you have a four-by-four four space, you, you know, it can build a little, a little a bed, put your dirt in there, put your seeds in there, and grow right outside. Now, if you don't have any space and you're – Say you're like how it is back home. You're wall to wall right next to somebody. You don't have mm -hmm. no space. You can grow it even if you have um, if you have any kind of window. You can put your little plants in styrofoam cups or you can put them in little pots in front of your um, window and use the natural light from the sun to grow different herbs that you would cook with. Um, it's like rosemary, sage, um, peppermint, um, you, the tomatoes, you know, even if you have any kind of light, you can do it inside. So it's, it's really no, there's no limitation as far as to what you have, because no not matter if you have a studio, you're going to have some kind of light. You're going to have at least one window. Yeah. So you, as long as you have some, some type of natural light, you're going to be able to grow something inside and you can do the hydroponic, which is, a hydroponic system you utilizes water and pumps and and you have liquid nutrients and you have liquid nutrients that go through a a, a system where you may use um different containers and you have tubes that go through that you can do that you can do aquaponics which you is similar which you just add fish into the water that produce you know their their droppings is natural fertilizer that's fish fertilizer um, which we also made our own fish fertilizer too, um, which you can get for free. Go to the to the um, butcher shop or the any market. Ask them for scraps like of the the fish seafood that they throw out and get some of that. And you add that with some little molasses and let it sit and let it let it do what it does naturally. Then you'll have a fertilizer. Boom, there you go. I, I so, wanted to talk to you guys about the composting piece because I don't know much about that but I, that is a thing so really you guys there's nothing that's wasteful on your farm nothing right so as that's you great. have containers or any kind of any you, you're breaking those things down and reusing it for the land is that really what you guys are doing with regards to the the plant material then um you know for for your composting system to be at its best in order for it to get the right amount of heat in order to, to you know, generate a, a significant amount of heat to break down the food scraps that you put in. You want mm -hmm. to use your raw fruit and vegetable scraps. Also, um, we utilize our, our leaf matter. We have a lot of hardwoods on our property and the leaves, is, that's something that, that earthworms in particular, they love. So that provides you with um, 
some carbon resources. You can also utilize plain cardboard, like cardboard that's not printed, just like your corrugated cardboard. We shred mm -hmm. that up and then that also gets processed. Um, newspaper is also something that can be utilized. So uh, from a composting perspective, we take all of those things, we have um, piles and we actually have composting bins and then we have some freestanding piles where we're adding you know, all of that organic matter into um, a pile and layering it on and, and you turn it, you know, every so often you make sure it's got like the proper water ratio, make sure it stays moist. And I'm telling you, it doesn't, it doesn't take much time, especially for the ones that, that sit right on the ground. You know, mm -hmm. those microbes and the microorganisms that are already existing within the soil, they come up they come into that space and, you know, they start to work their way in. They start to break things down. You turn it over, you know, you can see some um, mycelium activity. So, you know, now there's fungi in there and the fungi are starting to do their processes, which is, again, in breaking things down and then, you know, decomposing uh, organic matter. And it's just so rich. It's so black. And it's that to me is one of the, 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 the best things that we do with regards to trying to be in a zero waste environment is, taking and converting the food scraps, the fruit scraps, the uh, eggshells, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the seeds, you know, from different fruits uh, that we eat and that we utilize and that we grow. Even sometimes, you know, if, if an animal, for instance, we have deer in this area, we have rabbits in this area, we have moles in this area, we've got all kinds of little furry friends, um, you know, <laughs> squirrels and things of that nature. <laughs> and, you know, it comes along with the territory, right, where you've got to try and manage your, your animal, your local animal population, as well as... <laughs> <laughs> as well as the they, insect they population. The food's over here. They're like, come over here. They got all the food over here. They tell them to pay. So when you come across, you know, that strawberry that's partially eaten or that cucumber that's, you know, it's, been, it's, it's riddled with holes because, you know, somebody came yeah. and decided to take a little snack. And that, of course, goes into the compost as well. And sometimes, to Kenyatta's point, the beauty in that is that then we get volunteer plants out of that from the mm -hmm. seeds. You know, we've had carrots come in the compost, <laughs> potatoes squash, in the compost, squash, avocados. pumpkins, <laughs> like our avocados. We have a few avocado trees, and all of the avocado trees were born in our compost. Yeah. Wow. So you just take that. You just take that out, and then plant that, and then that's you have automatic plants. You know. So I mean. <laughs> Your compost is very easy, even if you juice or you uh, you do any kind of uh, like make smoothies, and you save all that. You save all the, the parts you don't use, and put it in a container. And then, as as you collect it, you put it out there in the dirt, and you just layer it up. Wow. Look it over all the time. The sun will do the job. The heat, the worms will come up from the ground and do as if you you know you're on the ground they'll automatically just go to it and they'll do the job for you. And that's wonderful because I, I, we've always recycled and, mm -hmm. and I just don't, I just don't like wasting, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. especially when there's, there's people, there's people that's without and like little bits of stuff, they would eat that. So for me, it's like, I, I don't like to waste anything. And then, yeah. So we use whatever we can use. We recycle whatever we can recycle, and we just do our part, you know. And it, it, it's a, um, it's a complete cycle, you know, with everything. Yeah. Because we got the, we have the waste, we have the compost, we have the plants. The plants produce. We have the food. We have the food for the people, and it's just a, it's a wonderful cycle, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, feel good it makes you it makes you feel alive that's that's what that's what real organic food does that's what i feel it, it it makes you feel alive you know you know that oh i'm good i'm i'm eating good like you said i know what's in there it's not gmo it's not no no pesticide no spray that's gonna make me be 10 feet tall or that's gonna you know that's gonna <laughs> who knows what who knows what? You don't even know. They're, they're not going to tell you what the ingredients are when you go to the grocery store. You got the big shiny apple that just looks like the ones on the cartoons. Like yeah. That's not how real fruit looks. Yeah. <laughs> a cucumber that's, that's a foot long and shiny and polished. Like, what did you do? Put polish on it? Like, no. <laughs> that's not it's how real. When you see real fruit and vegetables grow, you're going to say, wow, this looks different from the grocery store because it's <laughs> It, there's no polishing. There's no added it to it. I, it doesn't need to look extra. It just yeah. looks the way it does. You yeah. know what I mean? 
Exactly. And, and you know, some of our kids, it's 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 unfortunate when they don't eat enough fruits and vegetables or we're not growing enough for them because we see in some of the other foods that they're eating, the processed foods, maybe some of the meats that they are very uh, uh, mature looking for their age. Right. And it is acceleration because of greed, right? The, those people that are mass producing or wanting food to be able to turn around very quickly is, right. is you know, putting steroids and things like that in the food. And it's, you're looking at people like, oh my gosh, like you, <laughs> you, you look much older or bigger or, you right. know, more developed than you're, you, then typically, you know, you, you uh, other children, or when we were growing up, we would. I want right. to ask you guys because today is a, a snow day in Atlanta, not not Armageddon snow, but snow all the same. What is your day gonna What is your day gonna be like tomorrow? Right. So thank thankfully, right, the snow is just supposed to be for today. So what kind of damage control, or what are you? What is the first thing you guys gonna have to do in the morning to make sure your farm is okay? Your products are okay. Oh, goodness. First thing, uh, more than likely, will be just, you know, checking some of the plants that are still there. We, we've got brassicas that are in the ground now. We have a few enclosed systems and, you know, just get under there, check under the plastic um, and, and the covers in order to make sure that those plants have survived the lower temperatures. Uh, and currently, just because of the season that we're in, everything is in that down process anyway, again, with the exception of those brassicas, because things like turnip greens, collards, kale, they love the cold weather. So you know, they're thriving in this space. You know, and they actually taste better. Cabbages. Uh, we also had some broccoli that, that's out there. And um, again, it thrives. Swiss chard. They all, they love it. And actually, um, last year, we had, we had, you know, a small amount of snow and the plant leaves got frozen and next, you know, once everything thawed out, it was just, they just sprang back up and they were, you know, back to normal. So for us tomorrow, the process will just be just checking on everything. We've had these high winds. Let's make sure we don't have branches that have fallen. You know, that no trees have come down because we've dealt with that as well. Um, You know, just making sure that everything's okay from that perspective and that, you know, that we can then continue with the process of, of, of preparing for the spring. Yeah, yeah. I wanna, I wanna um, say this before I, I let you guys go. I want to shout out Kimberly Stewart Lucas because it was through the Reclamation Project that you and I met, that we met, and yes. it, and it was again community and Black people doing positive things in the community that we come together and we meet and we exchange. And I'm so thankful that you guys were able to spend some time with us today. I want to ask you this. Um, We talked about the Airbnb. If people have questions, what's the best way they can slide in? Can they slide in your DM on Instagram if they got some questions? How do you want people to get at you if they got some questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something that we're we're absolutely open to. We already filled questions there. We, our website, you know, as soon as someone hits the website, there is a chat feature there. And I'm telling you, I hear my ear is trained to that tone. When someone's there, I'm immediately (laughs) on it and saying, Hey, you know, this is welcome. How can we help you? You know, what can we what can we do for you today? So they also have that ability. And then our email information as well as our phone contact information is also on the site. Okay, awesome. What website is k2kfarms.org.com? Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. And I'm glad you said the .org portion because that is something that we'll be we'll be transitioning into into 2020 uh, 2022 is. <laughs> establishing a nonprofit foundation where we're doing education and helping our children um, in within a school environment, you know, hosting more of these teaching opportunities for people of all ages, but especially for our children, maybe yeah. forging some partnerships with the local school system in order to, you know, set up some beds and things like that in, in, on the actual school campus. Because to your point, within um, the perspective of being just responsible, you know, to our community and responsible to children and to, to our community as a whole, It's up to us to be the influence and to say, yes, this is where your food comes from. This is how you can start to change your diet. Here are viable options to you. Instead of drinking a a strawberry soda, eat a strawberry instead. Helping them to understand that this is where their food comes from. It comes from the dirt. It comes from the ground. And once we start to, you know, mend the fences in that regard and really educate our babies, then we'll be better and we'll be stronger as a people. We'll be stronger as a community once they know my food doesn't, it starts somewhere other than the grocery store aisle. 
Absolutely. Right. And let's remember our seniors, too, um, because they have a wealth of knowledge, especially here in Georgia, right? We were yes. probably so surprised and honored on how many people were farmers at one time or right. had grandmothers like yourself, Keisha, that knew the ground, that grew their collards, grew their turnips. And because of life, they haven't had the opportunity to have that reconnection. But some th somebody like you bringing a program with the help of children, connecting with seniors, that may add some years on their life. Just That's right. That's right. To touch that soil again, to have that turn of green in there, on their plate that this young person had cooked, you know, and the stories, right? We want to be able right. to bridge that gap, you know, so yeah, create right. legacy and the stories that go with it. Because we as Black people, we know we come together around food. <laughs> That's right. It's community, it's fellowship. It's community, it's fellowship. And to think that we would be coming around food that we grew, that is powerful. That is amazing. So, man, I want to thank you both for today. This was awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank thank you. you. It was our pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say, it, Keisha, you got finer since we first met. You are glowing. What have you been eating since <laughs> I met you? What are you it eating? is absolutely the land, you know, and that's one of the other things that I wanted to talk about because I'm a mental health advocate and I will absolutely say from an emotional intelligence perspective and mental yeah. health, getting in tune with the ground and being able to put your fingers into that soil and, and having that, just the benefit and seeing something, a, a little seed that you planted and nurtured and watched it grow. It's like, having a child. My children often joke around and they're like, oh, you're plant babies. How are your plant babies? Because that's <laughs> absolutely how I see that. You know, it's like, this is something that I'm nurturing and that I'm building up and that I'm growing and look at how it produces or look at how it heals or look at how it helps or look at how it feeds, how it nurtures. That it's, 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 it does wonders for, you know, for the mentality, for the mindset, from a calming perspective. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, um, you know, emotional development and, and mental health peace um, you know, imbuing uh, process. And we need that. We, we need that. One last shout out. Where can people buy your produce and, and fruits and vegetables? Is it Big Mama's Best? Is that, how can we get your stuff? Where Big is Mama's it? Best is the line and it is on our store. Again, on k2kfarms.com. That's where they'll find our wellness products, our pickle line, our herbal teas, our herb herbal remedies and supplements. Everything is there. k2kfarms.com. Awesome. And then we can find you on Instagram as what? K2K Farms on Instagram? Yes, yes. All right. And I know on the Instagram site, we have an email address. There's a phone number for texting. So if they get to you on Instagram, you're going to respond, whether it's the website, Instagram, just get at you and you got questions. They got questions and you guys will answer it. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Yes, so ma'am. Thank you so much, Michelle. This has been a Thank wonderful you, conversation, a beautiful experience. Real Chicks Rock. Black Farmers yeah. Rock. We are with it. Rock. Yes, we are with it. This is it. This is good. So we brought a little sunshine today, even though with snowy conditions here in the metro Atlanta area and up north, my friends up here farming in the north part of the city, like North of Marietta, 30, 30 minutes up in North of Marietta, it's getting some snow. But God was so nice. He allowed us to have electricity. So Power. Right. Power and internet. <laughs> to talk about it but that's my time you guys know where i am real chicks rap we're everywhere we're on instagram we're on twitter we're on facebook check out our website realchicksrock.com listen keisha took a picture of my t-shirt she bought the t-shirt she took it she styled it for christmas listen you know you need these t-shirts so you go to the website get your t-shirt order it take a picture of it let, let us know tag us on it so we can see how beautiful you look in the t-shirt this has been my time but listen i want to leave with this may you live to be a hundred and i live to be a hundred minus a day so i never know that beautiful people like you have passed away until next time take care be well and continue to rock on take care <laughs>